one, you're live. Good evening and welcome to our school committee meeting of January 11th, uh, 2022, our first uh, meeting of the new year. Um, we just came out of an executive session and, um, and so we will go ahead and start our meeting uh, because it's already been called to order uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ryan is gonna put up a flag, I believe. Yep, there we go, okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> As we do at um, every uh, the start of every one of our meetings, I'm gonna read our mission statement. The vision of the Wakefield Public Schools is to graduate students who are confident lifelong learners, who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college, career, and community by providing rich and challenging curriculum, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. Um, we're gonna go ahead and, oh, first of all, um, we are meeting remotely um, at the request of the, the WCAT staff. Um, <clears throat> our hope is to be back in studio soon, um, but we needed to be uh, a little bit flexible for the team in order to be able to accommodate kind of their resourcing needs. So that is why we're meeting remotely tonight. Um, we'll go ahead and do the public comment. I know um, Erin, you're here to speak and go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening. As my, most of you know by now, I'm Aaron Crisos. I'm the president of the Wakefield Education Association. Um, I wish I could say I was here with a happier speech today, um, but in fact, I'm quite disappointed to have to be here this evening. On November 9th, I spoke to you on behalf of our educators about hardships they were facing and a true desire to have you reach out to us to meet to begin to address some of those problems in the Wakefield public school system. That was over 60 days ago. In that time, we have worked together as colleagues to help one another through very challenging COVID needs. We have supported our students. We have risen to several different hurdles and challenges. Uh, what we have not done is received any word from this committee about the November 9th speech or our request and desire to meet with you. There's been no acknowledgement that we have spoken and no uh, attempts to reach out to work with us collaboratively. We were going to speak tonight to explain the value that we have to offer this committee and the work that you do to try and help shape the Wakefield public school system and move forward. But we believe at this point, we have made our value perfectly clear to all of you. The families and the students are well aware of the resources and the support that we provide them. So we are not going to beg you to include us in the work that you do. We are, however, gonna provide two choices for you this evening. Reach out to us and work collaborative, collaboratively with us and hear some of the ideas we have for the concerns and how to fix them in the school system or continue to meet us with silence and we will continue to have one-sided conversations through public comments. Uh, we look forward to a more timely response, preferably before your next school committee meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other public comment, Ryan? Uh, Madam Chair, not, I don't see any hands raised at the moment, but if anybody would like to, please raise your hand on the video. Okay. And don't see anybody. So typically we don't respond to public comment, but I, I am gonna um, briefly, Respond, Amy. Uh, uh, not Amy, sorry, Aaron. <clears throat> we have a lot of Amy's. Um, um, we just got out of an executive session where we actually spoke about kind of your your comments on the November 9th and our understanding that we did reach out to you after the 9th that you received that email and that you said that you would be speaking with the committee about setting up time to get together. So clearly, there's been kind of a miscommunication, um, and we will absolutely follow up with you tomorrow. Um, because it is uh, our understanding as a full committee that um, that follow up did happen, um, and so we will absolutely follow up tomorrow. And I uh, I apologize if that's kind of um, how you were left feeling. 
because that Great, was thank you. If you time. could forward that email that we did not receive, that would be fantastic. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, do we have any students from our student advisory council? It, am I seeing everybody, Ryan? That's kind of on. Yes, ma'am. There is nobody. In all those in the little room. blocks. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I don't know. You might, people are on without video. So if you bring up your participants panel, you'll see everybody who's on, but there's nobody in the waiting room currently. Oh, let me just look and see. Maggie or, um, yeah, no, it looks like we do not have representation from students tonight, which is fine. Um, so I will move on to the consent agenda. And um, Tom, do we have a motion? We do. Move the school committee, <clears throat> excuse me. I move the school committee approve the um, minutes of the school committee meeting of December 14, 2021, and to accept the minutes of the school committee finance and facilities subcommittee meeting of December 16, 2021, the school committee policy and communication subcommittee meeting of December 14, 2021, and the school committee student services subcommittee meeting of November 3, 2021, November 17, 2021, December 1st, 2021, and December 13th, 2021, as presented. Second. Uh, motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, Judy, roll call. Ms. Vea. Yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Mr. Boudreaux. Yes. Ms. Lehman. Yes. Mr. Ingalls. Yes. Mr. Priscadlo? Yes. And Ms. Wall? Yes. Okay. Um, my connection is a little glitchy, you guys, and so I, I may have to turn my video off, but um, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, budget items. Christine. Good evening, everyone. So tonight you have the financial reports in front of you for the first half, the first six months of fiscal 22. These reports go from July 1st to December 31st. Um, as you can see, we're halfway through the year. We've um, encumbered salaries and expenditures to date. It's sort of the part of the year where we kind of take a mid-year assessment of where we are. We do have a couple of lines that are over. So we'll be looking at um, those line items. Um, particularly contracted services for um, reasons due to tutoring services, um, things for um, a special ed um, department that we've had to bring in, um, but we will um, be making some transfers. Um, again, the grants are, we're spending down, we're in good shape. Uh, we're down to about 25% remaining for the final six months. Uh, revolving accounts are also um, in pretty good shape. We're still waiting for the December circuit breaker payment, which will make that um, negative 440. That will um, bring that more in line of where we should be at the halfway point. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Christine, I just had a question about um... Trans, uh, pupil transportation being at 72% already. Are we concerned about that at all? Or do we kind of prepay against, like I, I was looking at all those percentages thinking like we should be about 50% except for when we can, um, I can't remember the word, uh, encumber, um, encumber the expenses, right? And so some of these, I know like we're where we should be, but it, it, does that feel like we're, should we be worried about people transportation being at 72% already and we're just hitting that? So mark? that's 72% of the percent <laughs> remaining. Oh, so we would be underspending there. So we're, we're in good shape actually, yes. There we go, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yep, I mean, we still have, we're at the halfway point, so we still have some way to go. I mean, we still got winter sports and um, some activities going on and, um, but we, um, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Awesome, thank you. I should definitely know that and I'm a, a little embarrassed. I just asked that question out loud. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh. 
Any other questions for Christine, guys? Okay. So we don't have any gifts tonight, and um, we do have the payroll warrants for December to be approved. The two payrolls on um, the 10th and the 24th. I believe we have a motion. We do. I move the school committee approve payroll warrants number 24 and number 26 as presented. Second. Uh, motion made and seconded. Uh, discussion? Uh, no discussion. Um, seeing none. Uh, roll call vote, Judy. <clears throat> Fair. Uh, yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Mr. Boudreaux? Yes. Ms. Lehman? Yes. Mr. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Piscadlo? Yes. And Ms. Wall? Yes. Okay. Christine, anything else under budget items? We're all set, right? No, uh, I mean, further down, we'll talk a little bit about where we are in the budget timeline. Yeah, but that's it. great. Okay. Um, so the only comment um, I have tonight is I was um, contacted by a CPAC um, leader, I think. I'm, I'm pretty sure she's on the board, or um, but she's one of the parent leaders of, of the special ed um, parent. I should know what the AC stands for, advisory committee maybe um but the CPAC group and um and she was asking me like we have liaisons to some of the other kind of groups in um kind of in and about kind of both the schools and kind of the community like we have liaisons to the human rights commission and the youth council and to the environmental sustainability committee I think there was a desire from CPAC to have a school committee member um, kind of be a liaison to that um, to that group, <clears throat> and so I wanted to to bring that here um, publicly and kind of <coughs> excuse me mention it and um, and have uh, if any committee member is interested in kind of being that liaison, if you could just send me a note separately, um, and then I could get you in touch with the the person who reached out to me. Um, but I did want to put that out there. It seems to make sense for us to have a good sense of kind of what's going on with that group. Um, and I, I know a couple of our, at least one of our members is pretty involved in that group already. Um, but I, I think it would be, it, it would be good to have someone kind of, um, touchy base as a, as a liaison to that group. Um, <coughs> so I just want to mention that here, as I said, you guys can follow up with me, um, separately via email, if you're interested in doing that. Um, that is Susie? it. Oh, go ahead. Susie. Go ahead. Tom. Yep. Um, I you haven't asked for comments, but I, I want to throw in, I think that's a terrific idea. And as such, I, I would like to make a motion uh, that we add uh, to our official uh, our liaison roster, a liaison to uh, CPAC, and then empower the chair to uh, make such appointment. I didn't know that I needed to take that power. <laughs> so yes, that, that sounds great. So let's go ahead and make that motion. Okay, uh, so I make a motion that uh, the school committee um, add to its uh, list of uh, 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 liaison uh, organizations, uh, uh, the CPAC, Special, Educa Special Education Parent Advisory Committee, um, and to allow the chair to make an appointment in accordance uh, with how all appointments are made. Do I have a second? Second. Sorry. No, that's okay. Motion made and seconded. Um, any discussion on that? Okay. Uh, Judy, roll call. Ms. Fair. Uh, yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Mr. Boudreaux. Yes. Ms. Lehman. Yes. Mr. Ingalls. Yes. Mr. Piscadlo. Yes. Ms. Wall. Yes. Um. With that, I'm going to hand. Oh, Amy, did you have a question? Sorry, no, I was waving bye to my daughter. <laughs> okay, I was going to ask. Going to say, all right. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to hand things over to Doug uh, for superintendent um, remarks, reports, and recommendations. Thank you very much, Susie. I appreciate it. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, back on Zoom. And so I don't know if it's uh, better to be unmasked on Zoom or in the studio masked. It's kind of a, a toss up for me. Um, just an update in regard to our return to school um, after the holiday break. Um, before we went on break, I, I want to 
um, you know, give a shout out to uh, Tim O'Brien and and everyone in facilities that really kind of helped us prepare uh, for our return. And so before we left on break, we set up uh, PCR testing um, the Sunday before teachers came back. Um, and in full disclosure, we thought it was good practice, um, but I don't think that we anticipated um, that it would be so difficult to get a test, nor did we anticipate that, that Omicron, uh, the variant would kind of escalate and increase the, the rates of transmission as quickly as it has. So the fact that we set up testing, uh, we worked with Tom Walsh and Cataldo. Um, Tom Walsh is our emergency management director here in town. And so Tom kind of helped us set up a, a clinic for a Sunday morning. And we've done that for the last two Sunday mornings, but we were fortunate to be able to set that up. It, it actually was a blessing. Uh, before we returned, we tested close to 250 staff members um, before we came back, um, which really was, again, I think a, a blessing. And I think it gave people some sense of reassurance um, that they were negative. And you know, with all of the transmission and all of the spread over the holiday, I think that they felt secure to come back. Um, in our first week back, and in our first day back, our attendance rates um, for students um, was very low across the district. Um, low, usually, you know, our attendance rates are hovering around 95, 96, 97%. Um, right before or when we returned, our attendance rates were, you know, 84, 85%, which means we had about 15% of our students out. Um, in the first few days that we returned. Um, what our nurses and our administrators did um, is in the first few days is work really hard to understand um, what students and what were the numbers that were impacted um, or what absences were related to COVID. And so, you know, we, we've got that, we've gotten that data and we were able to finish the week last week um, with 200 student cases and about just under 50 staff cases. So, which is really um, exponentially, the, the, the increase is exponential, right? It's not linear like a straight line. It's a, it's a curve that has gone up exponentially um, and it has gone up that way across the state as, as Omicron now represents uh, almost 100% of the new cases um, in Massachusetts. You know, we're seeing um, positivity rates have recently risen above 20% in the state. Um, we're hovering around 20,000 new cases a day in, in the state. So that is uh, those types of numbers we have not seen before. Um, what we also have not seen in, with this variant is for people that are vaccinated, um, this variant seems to come very quickly and go very quickly, right? And so it, it seems to have more mild effects which leads uh, a lot of, I think, doctors and people that are reporting to us on the school side um, that this may indicate because cases are mild and sometimes asymptomatic, um, this may indicate that the rates of transmission that we're seeing and the positive cases that we're seeing are really um, underrepresented in the data. So they could be considerably higher than the numbers that we're actually seeing. Um, so, you know, if there is a, a positive to this, the positive appears to be um, that for those that are vaccinated, um, it, it comes quickly um, and seems to go quickly. Uh, people seem to be recovering rather quickly, which, you know, um, if there is a positive in, in, this, in this space, this, this may be it. There's, there's conversation happening right now um, with questions around, are we entering the endemic phase of COVID where this is a virus that we may have to live with. We don't know that yet. Um, and we do know that, you know, vaccinations and, and mitigation strategies like masks continue to be um, our best source of, you know, fighting off um, catching the virus. So that's kind of where we are currently. Um, our cases this week um, continue to be high um, but I will also share that the new guidance that we that has come out on December 30th 
not a particularly great time to release new guidance, but the new guidance that came out from the state that is also aligned with Mass DPH and now CDC, uh, CDC just, just aligned their guidance um, about a week ago, it was on January 4th. Um, but what it calls for is not a 10, day of, 10 days of isolation if you are in fact positive, but if you are asymptomatic showing no symptoms um, and you do not have a fever uh, for longer than 24 hours, um, then you can return to normal activity on day six as long as you return and you are masked when you do return. So those types of measures are still in play. Um, you probably have also seen um, the Commissioner of Education has extended the mask mandate in schools till February 28th, which comes also in line with our local Board of Health um, and the mask mandate that was kind of put out across um, the town of, of Wakefield. And so that has not had a dramatic effect on us in schools because we've been masked straight away for, for quite some time. Um, I know because we're talking about vaccinations, um, I did wanna share some data tonight just around vaccinations because I know I wanna beat Michael to the question that because I know you're gonna ask Michael. Um, so in regard to mass DPH, um, right now five to 11 year olds that are vaccinated um, in Wakefield um, account for um, individuals with just at least one dose right now is 62% with just over 52% that are fully vaccinated right now. So we're thinking in the coming days, we should reach that 62% number, which is terrific. It's really great for us. Um, in the 12 to 15 year old age group, we are at 81% um, uh, with at least one dose. And for fully vaccinated, we're at 76%. And, and for the 16 to 19 year old age group, we're at 86%. So you know our vaccination rates continue to be strong. Um, it has also kind of had a very positive impact um, on students. And, and if they are, because if they are vaccinated um, and they do become a close contact, um, they do not need to quarantine, right? And so that's been something that we have felt like is very positive in regard to the new guidance. Um, we are continuing with test and stay um, and symptomatic testing in schools. So that is currently happening. Um, what is another byproduct of this dramatic uptick in cases uh, throughout the state and in Wakefield, um, another byproduct of that is our ability to contact trace. And so um, just the sheer volume of numbers and the number of cases, we are going to be, um, we're working with our nurses right now, but we are going to be putting in print um, a new kind of prioritization of how we will contact trace we will be sharing that likely by Thursday, uh, midday. And so today's Tuesday, so Thursday, midday, we'd, we'd like to get that out. Right now we have it in print and our nurses are taking a look at that and to see how we might kind of work on that. The reason why we need to modify our, our contact tracing is because we simply can't keep up with the numbers of positive cases. And we're also following the lead of our Board of Health um, which has also needed to modify contact tracing. So this is gonna take some kind of getting used to, uh, we're gonna have to adjust to this, um, but we're also going to need to ask parents to, you know, we feel like our best opportunity to catch this virus and catch it early um, is to ask parents to please pay attention um, to their children in regard to them being symptomatic. If they are symptomatic, based on the list that we've provided, um, that we would ask you respectfully out of an abundance of caution to please keep your children home. If you have questions about the new guidance or questions about what you should do, um, a first best stop is really uh, your school nurses, um, our school nurses. They've been terrific. Yes, Michael. So Doug, uh, if, if, forgive me if you spoke about it already, but as far as staff and our, our staff absences, and how we're sort of handling that whole process would be great. Yeah. Um, so our, our faculty absences, um, you know, so we have 600 employees. You know, our, our staff absences, we were hovering around, um, I want to say, um, just under 10%, right? 
right? And so um, it has been a problem, you know, and I think what has happened is everyone has just kind of rallied to cover for one another. Um, our absences when on our first day back um, compared to this past Friday, this past Friday, we, excuse me, Thursday, I keep saying Friday, like we had school. Um, this past Thursday, excuse me, were considerably higher and our staff attendance this past Monday was much lower um, in terms of numbers out. So number of positive cases with faculty are less than they were a week ago. And we have people that have tested positive that have cycled back uh, with the new guidance and, and are back to work. Great. That's good news, thank you. Did I answer your question, Mike? You did, yes, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I also anticipated that you would have a question in regard to vaccination rates for faculty. And so, you know, I was, I was texting with Christine um, just to kind of check in. Buff, do you want to share where approximately where we are with, with staff, especially at the high school? Sure. Um, since we've been tracking this, and particularly in the past month, um, we've asked staff who are vaccinated um, with one or two um, of the doses to pr provide proof of vaccination. And we've seen our numbers just continue to climb. So currently we have um, about 90 staff who have just not provided proof of vaccination. So that for those 90 um, out of the 600, um, they are providing weekly negative COVID tests. Um, in terms of the high school, uh, we are um, just over 80% fully vaccinated. So that's encouraging. So those numbers are um, continuing to grow and staff are reaching out when um, they either get vaccinations or um, negative COVID tests. So um, there's a lot of communication going on with myself and the nurses, so it's great. Christine, could I ask a question? Um, Doug talked about the contact tracing getting a bit overwhelmed at this point in time. How was the test and state program going? Are you know, the rates going up all the same? So right as you can imagine, right after break, our numbers were um, high. So we, um, Tim, um, every day, he brings more supplies to the schools to make sure that the nurses have the, the adequate tests and um, that they have all the supplies they need. But we're very fortunate that we put that in place months ago. So we had all the permissions to test for both staff and students. So it was able to keep kids in school. So when we contact trace, um, kids entered test and stay for five days. And as long as they were negative, they were able to remain in school. So we were also fortunate uh, when, before we returned on the Sunday before we returned, um, Tim, Tim O'Brien on New Year's Day drove to Franklin Mass to pick up rapid tests that were distributed by um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed. Um, so they were originally supposed to come out on the day before, on Friday. Then they pulled a plug because the supply chain had gotten mixed up. But um, Tim was on the road six o'clock the next morning, um, picked up test kits for rap rapid test kits. Um, and we were able to provide all of our employees um, rapid um, antigen tests as well. And so if they were unable to get to testing on Sunday, they still had an opportunity um, to, to test themselves. Um, and we encouraged all to do that if they felt like they needed it or if they were symptomatic. So we've, we've been pleased um, at what we've been able to provide um, to our faculty and staff. Um, I'll be honest with you, I feel like because of the efforts of people like Tom Walsh, um, Christine Bufagna, um, Tim O'Brien, we've been able to kind of keep uh, people coming in and, and keeping schools open. So I, I think that they often, you know, uh, it's the people behind the scenes often that, that don't get recognized, but I feel like it's, it's critical. So between their very positive contributions um, and our staff, our faculty and staff every day has treated this like an all hands event. Um, you know, Kara Morrow has filled in um, in, in, a, in a classroom and an, an administrative position ahead of Brenda Casilius in Boston. I'm just saying there was no, uh, no news crews there, just saying. Um, but, you know, this has been an all hands event um, and people have been amazing. Our teachers have been amazing. Our specialists have filled in. 
Um, you know, they've just been just terrific. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that type of attitude is exactly what we need in this particular circumstance. So that's what we are currently working on. Um, I want to be clear, um, we are not stopping contact tracing. Um, we are, we will continue to contact trace. And so we're just going to prioritize, we're going to need to prioritize the number of positive cases that are being reported outside of school, right? So for example, our nurses come in and on their voicemail, they will get 30, 30 messages that say, you know, there are 30 new positive cases um, that have transpired over overnight. Um, and so they are, they're coming in school um, and they're prioritizing and really just making sure that we are um, attending to the most vulnerable students. Um, and if there are multiple cases in classrooms, we will be reporting that as well. Um, but we will, again, we're putting this in print and we will get this out on Thursday and likely this will start on Monday. And so there's, there's some, some time to kind of just process this. But that is, that is where we are right now um, in regard to COVID. Any questions before we move on? Stephen? Um, Doug, I just, I know that we had talked about this uh, maybe in last Thursday's meeting, but I know that there are some parents out there that are, have children that are vaccinated that are close contacts. Um, and there are some concerns that um, the test and stay program really only applies to those that are symptomatic and unvaccinated. Correct. Um, if we're seeing sort of any less, if we're seeing less of a strain on the test and stay, do we anticipate any option for parents in the future that if, if their children are vaccinated and they would like to opt in uh, for their own comfort level, is that anything that we might be able to provide at a future date? So I, I think that that, I think that we're going to need to look at, um, it's possible, Stephen, I, I think we need to look at just uh, the demands, if the demands change, right? And so right now, it looks like our, our students in quarantine are decreasing where our positive cases are going through the roof. This is the first week um, since COVID has arrived um, that our, our kind of quarantine numbers are lower than our positive cases. Right? I don't know if that, if, does that make sense? It does. If vaccination numbers are, are rising, then right. it exempts people from the quarantine. That would make sense. Right. And so, but what we're also talking about is, is are there different ways for us to employ uh, test and stay? Right. And so, so it's possible. And I do think you'll hear, we're going to be hearing more from our nurses in the coming weeks about just how things are going. Um, but, but it is a definite possibility that testing test and stay or the ability to test in schools might morph into something um, more robust than we currently have it. Um, but right now it's, it's all about numbers and cases and supplies that we're just trying to manage. Our, our first goal right now um, is to uh, test as many as we can um, based on the fact that they are not vaccinated um, and, and to try to keep schools, keep kids in school and keep schools open. But that's what we're doing right now. I had uh, one other question, which is just, I guess, more related to specifically sort of the Omicron variant and, and the place that we find ourselves in now. Um, are there any um, activities that, that we need to postpone sort of out of, you know, just uh, caution sort of to the rising numbers? I know there's a, a choral concert uh, that's happening at the high school level, that that's going to be only uh, really attended by those that are participating. And the WCAT's going to cover that, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we've had to make accommodations for or that we plan to? So we're looking at uh, professional development. We're looking at large group gatherings. So we're looking at professional development, faculty meetings, um, other meetings that we might be having in the district. Uh, we also have another choral concert coming up um, after our one um, this week. And so those will be without audiences. And so out of, again, out of an abundance of caution, um, with the exception of those at this point, Stephen, we haven't modified any other schedules. We have not modified um, um, sports schedules in, in their entirety. Um, we have modified um, individual sports schedules. We've modified wrestling. Um, just when we came back from break, they were supposed to have a tournament that we have postponed just because they're an, an outbreak. Um, we've also kind of looked at, you know, individual cases, you know, but, but some, some districts have been rather dramatic 
and kind of the um, putting things on hold. Um, and, and I don't, I, again, I think, you know, our athletic director is pretty proactive in this space and, and paying attention to the data and, and students that are, are positive or become, you know, are becoming symptomatic. And so I think, you know, our, our attitude there is, is as long as kids are testing negative, they have access to tests, they're testing negative, um, and they're not symptomatic, and we feel that we can do it safely, we'd like to try to keep students in their schedules engaged as much as possible. But, but that's what we've done so far. Great, thank you. You're certainly welcome. Amy? I just had a question. So I heard you say you, there would be modifications to the contact tracing. Are you looking at anything else right now? I know Melrose has some changes and we do share the same um, health director. Yeah, and so um, I met with Anthony yesterday. I met with um, the Middlesex League superintendents and I've talked um, quite a bit actually with, with Julie um, Kuchenberger um, as, and we, I met with Anthony yesterday and he shared kind of the proposals that they were making in Melrose. One of the things that they're proposing is kind of a hard line on a 10 day isolation as opposed to a five day isolation. And so, you know, there is some um, evidence that has been put out by Mass DPH that students are most symptomatic um, on, you know, the day before or day zero, essentially, days one and two. Um, and on day six, they are um, often, often not. Um, not still shedding the viral load, or it's if they are, they're doing it at a considerably less less of a rate. And so, um, it's my feeling that you know we're we're coaching families if your children are symptomatic out of an abundance of caution um, to keep them home. And so, we feel like um, that coaching comes directly from our nurses. Um, and that coaching is based on nurses that know students and families. So I feel like we are ending in the same place without a mandate. So I do feel like that, you know, uh, a number of families, a high percentage of families, if their children are symptomatic, are going to keep their children home. Um, it's a little bit like um, some things we've done in the past in regard to, you know, creating a mandate or just creating you know, when, they, when we used to, we have similar conversations, Amy, when we used to talk about the travel ban, you know, people would ask, what are we going to do about the travel ban? What are we doing to ensure that people don't break the rules? Um, I think what we did is we tried to support people. Um, and when we felt like people needed to be, um, get some different feedback, if we thought they were breaking the rules, we would speak to them individually about it. I think we're, we're kind of going in the same direction minus the ten, minus a mandate. And so I, I think that that's one of the primary differences between Wakefield and Melrose about kind of where we're going. Um, that's, that's one of the parts. The other part is, you know, they are looking at the definition for fully vaccinated. Um, so they made a proposal around, you know, changing the definition for fully vaccinated to align with the CDC, which means that um, if you are outside of six months of being vaccinated, then um, you're considered essentially not vaccinated, right? Well, the Department of Education, the guidance from Mass DPH and DESE is we are going to count those students and personnel as vaccinated, right? Because the thinking there is that that would increase access to schools, uh, both for personnel in regard to staffing, uh, but it would also increase access and opportunities for kids to continue to stay in school for longer amounts of time. I agree with that. I think that that's um, reasonable. Uh, again, all of these have exceptions. And I, I think the check and balance for us um, are the relationships that we have with families and our ability for our nurses and administrators to thoughtfully talk to parents. So I feel like we're going to end in a similar space there as well, minus a mandate. Thank you. No, I, I wasn't. And that was a great explanation. I just didn't want to get an email on Thursday with 
contact tracing and then like a subset of oh surprise <laughs> we're adding this so where, where we do agree where we are in agreement and i do think we're making a common change is in regard to contact tracing okay yeah so so those are the three changes that that melrose is making um yeah and okay. so we discussed this as just a, a, as another point of context we've discussed this in the middle league middlesex league and there are 12 districts in the middlesex league and i believe um, nine of the 12 are kind of aligned with kind of what we're doing and, and sticking with the state guidance. Okay, thank you. Sure. Doug, related to that question, is um, Anthony Choi's <coughs> recommendation and the fact that it differs for Wakefield than Melrose, yeah. is that it that because of kind of the way that Melrose numbers look? Like it's odd, it's interesting to me that his recommendation is different for Wakefield than it is Melrose. And yet that doesn't, it, it also, we're different communities. And so I, I just wondered, is that Anthony's decision and his recommendation or is that kind of a lot of people, people's kind of point of view on how, how we should handle things? Um, I, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think, um, I think the perspective of, um, the nurses over there are a little bit different. How they operate over there is a little bit different. You know, um, you know, if I were one, if we were one district out of the entire Middlesex League that was doing something different, I would be desperately worried. Um, but the fact that we are, um, you know, we feel like we're again going going to end up in the same place. So for me, a lot of this is about mandates, right? You know, I I think people. Um, need some latitude, right? They, they need to be able to make decisions um, that are good for their family and, and we will support them the best we can. That doesn't mean that we're gonna give someone a pass who's symptomatic in school. It doesn't mean that at all. Um, but I, I think sometimes when you um, try to kind of create an expectation, um, it, it's a little like the, the, if I can make an analogy, um, our local board of health in Wakefield um, just kind of talked about a mask mandate. And one of the things they were talking about are, are fines for masks for people that don't wear masks, right? And so the conversation went somewhere like, you know, can we enforce this, right? And so, you know, you can, you can, we can increase the requirements all we want, but if people don't have access to testing, you know, um, it's going to fall back to the schools and the nurses to try to work with families anyway. So I feel like why not just start there and try to be really vigilant and do it well. And I think it's something that our, our nurses and our administrators have done um, at a really high level, a really effective level. Um, now, are there, is there room for improvement? Always. Um, but I, overall, I think our nurses and our administrators and our teachers have been brilliant in this space. Right. If kids are symptomatic or if teachers are worried about kids, you know, our teacher will kindly send one of their children to the nurse. The nurse will make an assessment and we'll go from there. You know, so those are the types of things where, you know, we we have our, our nurses will often call a family and say, you know, you're not in test and stay. Can you get in test and stay? We'd like to test your child. And we test them and they stay in school. You know, those types of small, very kind gestures seem like a very small thing, but I feel like they go a long way. So I'm, I'm sorry for the long-winded answers, but there you have it. <laughs> Any other questions? Or you guys give up, uncle, too much? So Doug, before we hand it off to SMMA, yeah. I did see that Isabella from the Student Advisory Council did join us. She's not uh -huh. on video. She's not on video at the moment, so she may not be there. But okay. I did, I did. Oh, she's there. Look at that. <laughs> um, Isabella, I, I know you joined us late and I, 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 I'm going to totally take you out of order, which I probably need to get approval to do, but we're just going to do it. Um, did you have an update that you wanted to give or are you good? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just me. Sophia was going to be here, but she had another commitment. We had a problem with the Zoom link, but we're all set now, obviously, in here. <laughs> but yeah, I did have a quick update that I wanted to give regarding academics and 
uh, other extracurriculars. So awesome. for academics, Ms. McLeod emailed students and families early last week, notifying them that mid-year assessments have been scaled back. This decision was made based on rising COVID numbers, the impact on attendance for both students and adults, the availability of coverage and the anxiety that these issues are causing. Please see her email on January 5th for more information. And regarding extracurricular activities, uh, there's no school next Monday, January 17th in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So, I guess that's other school news, not extracurricular, sorry. But other school news is that the senior class is running a winter giveaway fundraiser to raise funds for the end of their senior year activities. The raffle winners will be announced on Tuesday, January 25th at their fundraiser at Fuddruckers in Reading. Please reach out to Ms. Nigro or Mr. Hanrin, class advisors, with any questions. And that's all I have for today. Awesome. Thanks, Isabella. I'm, I'm glad you were able to, to give that update. Um, any questions for, for Isabella? Okay. Thanks for joining us. All right, Doug, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Isabella. We're always better with students here. Thank you. Um, so that's all I have at this point. I, at this, if there are no other questions regarding the information that we shared um, and the update, um, we can move on to SMMA. I'll just make one more point. Um, you know, last week we sent out a few pieces of information. Um, we sent out updated COVID-19 guidance. We just tried to summarize what the new guidance that came out on December 30th, how we might be able to put that in play. Um, so we sent that to faculty and staff and, and to families. And so, so Kara took the lead, Kara Morrow took the lead on, on putting that together. Um, and I think she worked with our nurses and really did a, I think a great job there. So we feel like that's an active reference for us and we'll be using that in our weekly communication as we move forward. We also had a question this past Thursday um, about the discomfort that some families have in sending their children back with the high transmission rates of COVID. Um, and they had asked if we would inquire with the department um, about the possibility of remote instruction. And so uh, we've done that. We've reached out to the department. And, um, and the answer that we've gotten is that um, at this point, at this time, the goal of the state um, is to keep students in school and we are not um, offering a remote option at this point that would be covered under um, student learning time. And so we want to be respectful of um, the the you know the needs of students and the needs of families and so we will be addressing that uh, again on Thursday afternoon on our zoom call with families so if there are no other questions at this point I can turn it over um to um to Brian Michael I'm sorry go ahead sorry Doug I did have a question about remote obviously the DESE uh, ruling will, will abide but how prepared are we if we had to make that switch in your mind so I think we're very prepared, Michael. And so we've we've closed classrooms, Mike. Mm -hmm. So we we've um, just before break we closed a kindergarten classroom, um, and it was the same classroom that we closed right before the the holiday break last year. Same same classroom, same teacher. Um, but the te the teachers pivoted uh, very quickly, and you know they had remote instruction set up for their class for kindergartners. Um, and I think it went exceedingly well. Um, we did that at Dole Bear. And so we're, I, I do think if we need to close a classroom, I do think our teachers um, will really, I think that they're prepared to make it work. Great, thank you. Sure. So just another point of reference, because we usually get this question as well. Um, so if we close a classroom, do we need to make up that day at the end of the year? If we close a classroom, the answer is no. We still need approval from the Department of Elementary and Ed to make any closures, um, but for closing classrooms, we do not need to make up that day at the end of the year. If we close a school, we will need to make up that day at the end of the year. It's different. So not to get into the so many technicalities, but there you go. Um, I, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to, to SMMA. 
Uh, uh, can I just can I just add one thing onto your point about Desi? I'm sorry. I just mm -hmm. feel like it's worth mentioning that um, we know that we follow the guidance of Desi when it comes into remote schooling, and yes. just to inform parents that there is a mechanism if you go to the Desi website where you can sort of reach out to them directly and share your concerns and questions. Um, they have set up a site where you can just sort of email in. Um, and I think the more, you know, if parents want to feel heard, um, I feel like that is an absolute, um, it's an avenue that people should feel free to take. Yeah, thank you so much. So third time is a charm. <laughs> and so I'd like Come to on. introduce uh, Shane Nolan yep. from Left Field Project Management Group. Um, Shane is taking the lead at kind of guiding our work um, and, and kind of coordinating um, efforts with the architectural firm that we're working with, SMMA. Um, and, and they've been just really exceptional to work with. And so excited to turn it over to them and let them kind of share a bit about what we've been doing. Shane? Great. Thank you, Doug. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're happy to, to be here tonight to give you an update on the, the high school project. Um, as Doug said, I'm Shane Nolan with Leftfield Project Management, the, uh, the owner's project manager. Uh, and we have SMMA, our design architects, uh, here tonight, um, Brian Black and Helen Fantini. Um, so we're going to give you a quick overview of where we are on the project, what we've done since we last uh, presented to you guys in May of last year, and uh, then we can certainly open it up to any uh, questions. Uh, so next slide, Brian. Uh, so just the agenda, we'll go through the process and schedule quickly. Uh, some of the existing condition assessments that uh, our designers and engineers have been doing. Talk a little bit about the educational visioning, programming, and educational plan that we're working on. We're going to look at some of the conceptual design alternatives that uh, our designers have come up with. Um, and we're going to talk about the criteria uh, that we're looking at uh, with those designs and how we're going to narrow those down to, uh, to a smaller number of design alternatives where we're going to go to the next step and start developing them in a little more detail. Next. Um, so our uh, partners with MSBA, the Mass School Building Authority, uh, this is their process. It's an eight-step process, and we've showed you guys this slide before. Um, the last time we came to you, we were in Module 2, forming the team. Uh, Left Field had just come on board, and we were, we were in the process of hiring an architect who was SMMA, um, who are now on board and came on board in September. Uh, we moved into uh, module three, which is a feasibility study, and uh, talk about what the feasibility study includes in a moment. After that, we go into mod four, which is a schematic design, and then module five, which is funding the project. So at this stage, uh, those are the five modules we'll work through. At the end of uh, module five, we'll uh, go to the town to look for funding in order to progress to, uh, to module six, seven, and eight. Um, so, so module three, the feasibility study, um, as I said, we brought our designers SMMA on board in September. Um, since September, we've been working with the, uh, with the school, the public building, uh, the permanent building committee and the school building committee to work through uh, two submissions that we uh, sent to MSBA. The first of those is called a preliminary design program. Uh, we're working through that right now. Uh, I would say the preliminary design program is very much a a fact-finding uh, document. Um, it reviews existing conditions. It reviews the educational program. Uh, we review the current spaces within the high school. Uh, we also put together a, a new space summary of proposed spaces for a new high school. And uh, we'll start to look at an evaluation of options, which, which we're going to show some tonight. Um, We'll submit that, that PDP or the preliminary design program to MSBA in February. Uh, and then we'll move straight into the second milestone during the feasibility study, which is the preferred schematic design, which is when we start to look at some of those options in more detail. At the end of uh, preferred schematic, we'll have to pick one option to propose to MSBA in the town uh, as the school project. Um, that will be in the summer, hopefully before we get out of, of school. And then through the summer, we'll work with MSBA um, to uh, to pick that um, preferred option before we move into schematic design. Uh, so just some of the things we've done since September. Um, MSBA have been, been very busy. Uh, and thank you to, to Doug and, and 
Principal uh, Amy McLeod and, and Tim O'Brien for facilitating a lot of uh, site visits and, and surveys in the school. I know it's been difficult uh, to have people coming and going, but as we may have been busy, uh, they've completed their, their existing condition surveys, including the uh, mechanical, electric, plumbing and fire protection systems. Uh, they've done an inspection of the building exterior, the exterior walls, windows, uh, and also the roofs. They've had their hazmat consultants come in, do some uh, material testing to look at any hazard material uh, that's in the building that needs to be abated. Um, they've also had their uh, geotech engineers out. They spent two days uh, on site drilling, doing some borings uh, to see what the soil conditions are like. We, uh, we just got the report back for that. And they've also had a site survey crew uh, have spent a couple of weeks out there just surveying the site on a uh, traffic crew spent a couple of days out there doing traffic counts at the major uh, junctions on Farm Street and at the high school. Um, as I said, we've been working with the permanent building committee and the school building committee. Uh, just some of the public meetings that we've had since uh, since September. Um, we did, this first one isn't a public meeting, but we did spend four days at the school, uh, at field and MS, MS, MMA. We, uh, we met department coordinators, teachers and staff uh, just to go through what, what the conditions are right now, uh, how they're teaching, what the programs are, and to get information on, uh, on how the school is run at the moment. So uh, that was very useful. Uh, we also had four educational visioning workshops. Um, there was about 38 or 40 people who volunteered to, to do these educational workshops. We had a series of four of them, about two and a half or three hours each. So we did about 10 hours of educational visioning, uh, which was very, uh, very useful and really got some some good ideas from uh, from teachers, from the public. I think some some of you folks were, were also part of that on uh, what people would like to see in, in a new building and, and what their vision for the, the new building is. Um, we've had two public forums, uh, one to just give the public a general update on the project. And the second one was a uh, to review the educational visioning workshops, presented that to the public and some of the findings on that. And since September, we've also had six permanent building committee meetings, again, open to the public, where we've uh, updated the, the permanent building committee and the school building committee on the progress to date through the uh, preliminary design program. Next. Um, so again, following the, uh, the two submissions to MSPA and the feasibility study, we'll go straight into to schematic design. Um, this is where we'll, we'll pick one option uh, where we, we bring up to a schematic design, and that would be the project uh, that we propose to MSBA. We'll work through that for, uh, for about six months, the second half of the year. We'll submit that to MSBA. We go back and forth with a series of meetings with, uh, with MSBA. Um, and that will uh, finish with the, uh, the MSBA Board of Directors meeting in December of 22, when uh, we expect that they will approve the project, uh, including the, uh, the scope for a new school and the budget, including the, uh, the reimbursement that the town will receive as part of the, the state program. As I said, after that approval from the, uh, the MSBA, we will, uh, we will start to, uh, to go back to the town, uh, look for, for funding approval from the town. That will uh, likely happen uh, December to February, uh, late this year, early next year. Um, and after that, uh, pending approval, we will move on to the detailed design and, and the, uh, the construction of the project. Um, so that's the, the process where we are so far. Um, next slide, Brian. Again, this is, is just a schedule it shows you sort of what we've done and, and where we are now. And um, you can see in the sort of the, the, the yellow, the brown color there, we, we've formed a team, uh, Left Field and SMMA, we're working through the feasibility study. We expect to submit that PDP to MSBA on February 3rd. We'll continue to work on the preferred schematic report, submit that to MSBA May 4th of this year. Uh, going to schematic design pending MSBA approval at their board meeting in June uh, and culminating in, in MSBA board meeting in December of 2022. So that's our, our schedule. Um, I can certainly stop and, and take any questions now or we can continue into, uh, into the design alternatives. Actually, Shane, I do have a question. Um, sure, yeah. So the, the timing of that calendar is interesting, right? Because our town meetings where we vote on things like this happen in April and November. 
sure. or actually May and November. Yep. So my assumption is that we can't get it <laughs> done in time for May of 2022. And that's why it, or sorry, November of 2022. November. And that's why it's in there for January of 2023, even though that's not when we typically would vote for something. So has there been, I mean, I, I would be shocked if there hasn't been discussion about, could we pull that in to try to make the November town meeting that's already, you know, that happens, or are we really talking about this not being able to go in front of, uh, for funding until April of 2023? Um, well, we, we don't think we can make that November meeting. Um, MSBA, I mean, MSBA's board only meets six times a year. So we're uh, so every we're other month stick to that their schedule. So we'll we'll go with PSR in in June. Uh, and, you know the schematic design will take about about four months to do, and then they have a you know a six week review. So really, the the earliest we can get to MSBA, I don't think we can get to their October meeting. Uh, the earliest we can get to MSBA is in December. Um, we we've had preliminary discussions with with the uh, the permanent building committee in the town. Um, you know, January, February, we, we've sort of plugged that in for now, whether it'll be a special town meeting that we would do then, or whether we would wait until April, we haven't decided that, but unfortunately, uh, we, we don't think we can make the, uh, the November town meeting. And we certainly, you know, we don't want to rush this either where, where, you know, we go, go to the town or the MSBA with a project that's not fully developed. No, oh, totally understand that. Okay, I just I, I assumed that you guys had had the conversation. I just wanted to, to most of us, if not all of us on this call, kind of understand the, the timing of when those votes happen. And it's good for us to understand, like we're also working within the constraints of MSBA's six or <coughs> six meetings per year. So Correct. thank yeah. you. Um, so, so that's the process and schedule with that. I can, I can hand it over to, to Helen or Brian. Okay, next slide, please. So um, as Shane has mentioned, we've been spending the last three months in sort of a fact-finding mode, right? Getting to know uh, the physical aspects of your building and site um, in all of the visual and then of course, more invasive investigative work that we've been doing that, um, you know, again, Shane has mentioned geoprobes and um, additional testing, wetland flagging, et cetera. So um, this is a site plan that sort of outlines some of, some of what we learned about the site and that of course will affect uh, how any conceptual options might be developed. So in addition to getting to know all those physical aspects of, of, the, of the building and site, um, we've been learning about um, the educational goals for uh, Wakefield Memorial High School. And um, if you go to the next slide, please, Brian. Um, as Shane mentioned, we had um, conducted these four educational visioning sessions. Um, again, I know some of you were there. Um, the four bubbles uh, sort of indicate the, the topics of each of those sessions. And um, really what, what all of that work, what all of that information gathering, um, testing, sort of showing you design um, examples does is to, to help to develop what you see on the left, these guiding principles for design. And they also help to shape the educational plan, which is um, a product that Doug and Amy are working on right now. That's a very important roadmap for us as designers to take forward as we move into uh, exploring uh, some of these conceptual designs that Brian is going to share with you. Um, go to the next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Brian to walk through um, the conceptual options that we are uh, looking at right now. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm not running the slideshow. I don't know. It's a little spooky, but uh, it's fine. Um, you guys are just very organized, I think. Um, uh, so I'm Brian Black, architect with SMMA. Uh, we have developed 11 options for consideration by the school building committee, um, all of which we've been asked to share this evening. So I'll try to move briskly. Um, we'll narrow these options down, uh, as Shane uh, mentioned, to three options, which will be later explored uh, a bit more fully uh, in the next round uh, before a single option is ultimately selected. Um, we have three sites we're evaluating for the study, uh, the existing high school site, 
Beasley Oval and Walsh Field. Uh, so consider these options as test fits for each site. Uh, each is constrained by a combination of, of roads, adjacent properties, topography, wetlands, existing structures, uh, and the like. Um, but we assume uh, in our each option, we're recomposing a full campus, meaning that there's a fully functional school, a track and a field, baseball field, and tennis courts. Nothing is being displaced from what you currently have. Um, we've been asked to show in all options uh, a realigned Hemlock Road at Farm Street uh, to alleviate some uh, long-standing uh, traffic concerns. Uh, so this will be considered an offsite improvement within the project, its cost being carried as a line item separately in the budget. Um, so onto the options, we have two slides summarizing them and then I'll go into a bit more detail. The first one is a, a strict code upgrade. Um, no changes fundamentally to the architecture or the educational uh, makeup of the existing building. It makes the building safe, habitable, uh, and accessible. The next four options are renovation schemes, um, and they utilize varying portions of the existing building uh, so as to reduce construction costs and other impacts. The next slide um, is a, if, if we may, is a series of six options, all new building, the first three being cited on Beasley Oval and the last three being cited on Walsh Field. So we'll move to each one now. Um, the option one is a complete code upgrade uh, of the existing facility uh, to comply with uh, uh, current life safety, uh, energy, mechanical uh, and accessibility codes. Uh, it includes a large amount of renovation to building entrances, walkways, enclosures, uh, mechanical systems, hazardous materials uh, abatement. It does not include updating the educational patterns of the building from a 70 year old model and which would cement those in place for another several decades. Uh, it does require temporary facilities while renovations are ongoing, uh, but it leaves the adjacent field resources untouched. It does not include the uh, aligning hemlock road. This is the one option that does not. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm going to speak to options 2A and 2B together first. Um, these are uh, each a partial demolition, partial renovation of the existing school, uh, meaning the field house and the academic wings. Um, by the way, north is to the right on these diagrams, in case you, this is not lining up with your um, memory of, of Google uh, Earth. Um, the uh, building's uh, options maintain the current uh, traffic circulation patterns uh, of the school, but they provide a more generous entry and sort of uh, a gathering space along Farm Street um, on, on the top of the page. Um, both require temporary facilities up to a three year construction uh, period, uh, but the field resources are untouched in both of these. If we go to the next 2B option, uh, it reconfigures the building a little bit differently to increase the proportion of renovated space, um, but this may be a bit negligible in terms of the overall uh, evaluation. The next uh, option, uh, two options, 2C and 2D, uh, are both uh, renovations of just the field house and the adjacent phys ed athletics wing. Uh, the remainder of the school is rebuilt on Walsh Field and connected over Hemlock with a bridge structure. Um, once complete, the existing school is demolished to make way for the replaced Walsh Field and the tennis courts. Um, only the field house re uh, requires the temporary facilities. The remainder of the building can continue to remain in place while the new building is constructed. Uh, that's a, a bit of a, 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 um, a positive aspect of this. 2D is similar. Um, it's a sort of what if option uh, that places the renovated building on top of where Hemlock Road is now and reconfigures around. Um, it's a bit of a maybe a non-starter in terms of the, um, the the infrastructural gymnastics that are needed 
Um, also, we know that hemlock is, uh, is controlled by DCR. And so there's an administrative and, and sort of approvals uh, aspect to, to all of the Walsh field options, um, which we'll see in a minute. Next slide. The three series uh, options are new building on Beasley Oval, uh, rebuilding Beasley on the current high school site. Uh, 3A is a model school approach. So taking an already designed school, this is um, a design that MS, SMMA uh, did for Grafton High School, which is a, a fully constructed uh, school, um, but with modifications to accommodate increases in program. If we go to 3B, the next slide. Um, 3B and 3C are uh, uh, custom tailored layouts to Wakefield's program. Uh, they assume humanities, STEM, arts, uh, phys ed, um, and health occupy clusters or pods ar ar arrayed around a central common space. Uh, the main uh, entry and primary building elevations face Farm Street, although at a distance. Um, and then the 3C variant, the next slide, uh, is the location of the gymnasium. So flipping to the other side, uh, which may be more central to athletics on the south end, but might be more architecturally palatable uh, on the north side, considering the approach to the building. Um, so we also show uh, an outline in red of a what a 30,000 square foot um, field house uh, would look like on the site. Um, these options, both three and four, uh, can be built without temporary facilities uh, building being in place until the new building is constructed. Um, and in this one, Walsh Field uh, is untouched. Next slide. Uh, the four series uh, explore a building on the Walsh Field site, uh, shown enlarged again with the proposed relocation of Hemlock Road. Um, option uh, A shows, uh, again, a model school this one being North Middlesex Regional High School, which has a little bit more of a squarish form. Um, again, Walsh Field uh, is, uh, is, is the location of the, of the renovation. So, um, or sorry, the new building. So Beasley Oval is untouched in this scheme. And then moving to 4A, 4B and 4C, sorry. Um, these are again, custom layouts using the pod approach uh, to the building clustering, um, fully in line with all the programming for a, a next generation school. Uh, these options uh, don't require temporary facilities. Uh, one disadvantage of the Walsh site is the relatively short space to get traffic queuing uh, off of Farm Street. Uh, so it's, it's something, an issue that we continue to work on. Um, these options are uh, works in progress, um, and we'll we'll use all the time we have to uh, to continue to improve them. Um, the next uh, uh, option is another iteration, uh, simply showing a different um, orientation of the traffic pattern, uh, hereby creating a, a sort of a a one way road along the the, uh, the school, uh, and letting Hemlock. Uh, flare out to the right side of the oval. Um, uh, we are looking at elongating the drop off so that we can, uh, again, um, deal with the traffic uh, flow issue uh, for Walsh as best as we can here. So those are the 11 options. And I'll hand it back to Helen. Yeah, I think um, we certainly are happy to take um comments, questions, and concerns, but just to let you know, at, our, at the next PBC-SBC meeting on Thursday evening, um, we will be, you know, starting to apply some of these criteria that we've been developing along with the committees to help to make sense of all of those options. It may or may not be obvious to this group which ones sort of rise to the top, um, but we're trying to develop criteria that um, will help us to evaluate each, each one against the other. Um, so that is a work in progress as well. And again, more on that um, this Thursday evening at the PBC-SBC meeting. Um, 
happy to open up for questions. I know we just um, hit you with a lot of information and um, certainly let us know if there's any slides you'd like to go back to. Um, but that's where, um, where we've been able to um, bring the project to um, in terms of developing these, these options. Helen um, or Brian, I don't know who could answer this um, best. I'm just curious, um, does the MSBA um, cover um, all or partially the need for a swing space? Um, is it called out in any of their uh, sort of what they would bring back? Yeah, yeah I, I kind of say the, the MSBA doesn't cover any costs for swing space. So if, if the district has to rent space or bring in modulars, that, that is all uh, non-reimbursable by MSBA. They won't cover any of that cost. Thank you. Amy? Um, so I, some of the, um, the renderings they showed with the fields that are moved over, if my memory is correct, some of the grade changes are, were about 10 feet or so in the front of the school to the to um, Beasley Field, or Beasley, I'm sorry, Oval. Is that, um, is that something that if you were to move the, fil the fields, you'd have to fill in, or how does that work? Yeah, that's true. Um, and I, I, I appreciate you picking up on the three dimensionality of the problem. Um, you know, with, with a grade change like that from front to back, from Farm uh, Street back to you know, the other side of the oval, um, we are thinking about you know, where that happens. Is it incremental? It can't really be because we have these large sort of swaths of flat area, whether it's a building pad or it's a playing field. And so uh, we're looking at, you know, what are the, what are, what's the best location to have uh, basically a retaining wall, or um, we could try to split uh, the, the difference of levels as we move back. We'll also look for economy when we look at cutting and filling the material. So we're taking out material as we uh, excavate for the building. Um, so that can be equalized with uh, material that we're uh, we need to put back in other places. So um, that's part of the detail we'll get into more in I think the next round. But the um, uh, the sense is that you know well MSPA requires an addition renovation uh, uh, option, and so that will be one of the ones that goes through. And then uh, one could assume that Beasley Oval is attractive for many reasons and is likely to be one of those. So we'll be developing all of this site design in three dimensions as we go forward. And as far as um, the, the sites, um, were there any DEP issues or anything like that that was found that's concerning or did everything look good in those studies? Um, Helen, did you wanna pick that one up? DEP. Um, it there, I, I believe there's the presence of a couple of underground storage tanks close to the building. Certainly nothing unusual um, with buildings and of this vintage. Um, so depending on you know, what option uh, is pursued, certainly we'd have to um, uh, remove, remediate, et cetera. Um, but nothing, um, nothing really out of the ordinary for um, a, a building of this vintage that could not be dealt with. And, and like on virtually something? every site that we're working on, there are wetlands on, on the edges. Uh, and so those are being flagged. Um, we'll have yep. um, more, more precise locations. We're fairly confident with, in the diagrams, there were some blue areas, uh, which also have a buffer zone. So we're not in the 50 foot buffer for the wetlands. Um, um, we are in within a hundred feet, but uh, we feel that that's reasonable. And then any um, mitigation that has to happen to remove those items, does um, MSBA pay for that or is that something that we would foot? Um, MSBA um, reimburses 8% of the construction cost for site works. Um, that's their policy. Uh, I've never worked on a school project that was less than 8% for site work. Um, so it's reimbursable up to the cap um, but we will be over the cap. Thank you. 
So we'll, we'll, we'll come back, or we, we haven't really gone through the, the reimbursement detail yet with the, the school building committee. Um, I think we're going to do that in February or March. We're, we're due to do that. And certainly once once we do that, we can come back to you guys. But there is certain uh, you know costs that are categorically not reimbursable. There's certain costs that there's a cap on, and there's certain costs that they'll reimburse 100%. Um, and we'll be happy to come back to you in the future and look at that. Shane, when you evaluate, oh, Mike, uh, it's kind of related to that question. So when you evaluate the, each of the plans for the criteria, I would think that that kind of reimbursable elements would also be a part of that <coughs> evaluation or no? Um, it, it would to a certain degree, Susie, but, but again, it, it, it's the caps. So, you know, the, 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 the two big ones are, are the site work. It's 8% of construction. Uh, we'll be over that cap. So we're not going to get reimbursed 100% for site work. And the other uh, cap is construction costs. Um, I think it's $360 a square foot that MSBA reimburses. Um, school construction costs are up around 650 to 725 a square foot now. So anything over 360 is 100% is on the town. Um, so you, you know, while we take that into consideration, we're, we're, we're not going to be below those where, where uh, everything will be, be reimbursed, but we're going to look at, you know, the most economical solutions uh, for the town uh, when, we, when we come to look at the criteria and evaluating these. Got it. Mike, go ahead. Uh, question. Uh, most of the renderings seem to have a relocation of Hemlock Road so that it points directly to Nahan Street. So I know, I believe you said earlier that the construction cost for that redirection of Hemlock Road is not covered by MSPA. So that's one question. And the second one is really just more of your perspective. I assume if that were to happen, we'd like to be putting traffic lights at that intersection at that point in time. Is that fair? Um, I, I think we're still evaluating that. Um, and what we what we do at, at that junction of Hemlock, Nahant, and, and Farm Street, um, we we do have a, a focus group that met um, this week to to look at some of the site options. Again, you know we're, we're, we're reviewing everything, so I think a traffic light, a roundabout, and uh, and just a, a four way stop with uh, pedestrian crossings are all sort of options we're looking at. Um, we, we we haven't approached. D, um, DCR yet? Um, you know, obviously they're, 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 they'll have to be part of this conversation, um, but we are we are looking at, at those three options right now. Great, thank you. Shane, can I can I just ask, in terms of how you're going to sort of have that conversation with DCR? I assume we're also sort of paying attention to the Northeast Folk School and how they're talking about having another entrance out onto farm and. And how that traffic will will sort of impact Hemlock. Um, what are your thoughts? And some of these seem very conservative in terms of the way that we realign uh, Hemlock. But sort of the one that we're looking at now, there was another one that was um, sort of an in out. Um, you know, they came off of. I think that's Old Nahant um, and came around. They seem a little bit more dramatic of a, a change to Hemlock. Do we imagine that we'll get any negative feedback from DCR on that or? I, I expect we, we, we could, Stephen. Um, you know, the, the one we're looking at here, again, these are these are very conceptual. And I think, you know, we were tasked with with trying to to alleviate some of the issues at, at Nahant, Hemlock and Farm Street. And that's sort of what we've been doing. How, how we do it, we haven't gotten to the, the conclusion of that yet. Uh, you know, this one, for example, one of the concerns I might have with this one is, is it being... I've talked to, to Joe Conway at, at the DPW, and you know, he said even though Hemlock is is controlled, I think is a word that was used by by DCR, the town ends up plowing in, and you know they 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 do some of the work. Um, if if the drop off is going to be on Hemlock, it, it might be an issue for DCR. So we may have to you know when we go to talk to them, they may say, hey having all your school buses line up on, on, on Hemlock is, is, is not going to be allowed. So we'll have to take the drop off off. So we haven't had those conversations yet. Um, the option Brian showed where we, we go around the school. Um, 
one of the one of the renovation addition projects. You know, I'm I'm not sure that that would be advantageous to the school or DCR, um, because it's still a public road, and I'm not sure that the, the school wants a public road circumnavigating the school. So. We're conceptual, we're throwing ideas out there now, but we haven't sort of sat down to, to talk to, to DCR yet. Thank you. I have a, a comment and then a question. The first was, this is my first time being on the school building committee. It's been a really interesting process. I had kind of shared that with the community before. The envisioning sessions were fascinating and it was great to be a part of. Something that I know that's taken quite a bit of time, some of our meetings was talking about the field house. Um, can you talk about, I know we, we were thinking about, or I think it's been talked about, is it something that we want to look at maybe assuming more of a cost to have a bigger field house, one that potentially maybe even as an indoor track, like those sorts of things. In those, you showed one conceptual drawing I forget that had the 30,000 size, like this one that we're looking at now, how big is that gym slash field house? Yeah, it's a difference of about 12,000 square feet. This uh, gym that we're showing with the three cross courts, that's 18,000 square feet. So that's similar to the field house so-called that you have now. Um, I think that's about 17,000. Um, so those are comparable in size. Um, so the request is for something that's considerably larger uh, at 30,000. And we, we did want to depict that on the plan to show, you know, what, what kind of area that consumes because there is, we are fairly constrained with the sites that are available. The building itself is approaching three acres in size. And I, you know, um, the Walsh field site is probably being constrained to something like five or six acres. So not, not much room to maneuver there, but there is a strong desire um, to um, incorporate a lot of the outdoor um, especially the outdoor track uh, elements um, inside. Um, and so, uh, Shane, I don't know if you have other comments on that relative to what MSBA um, uh, is, is doing in projects for large gyms, uh, but- uh, Yes, so, so yeah, so, so the, the, the MSBA template, um, it, it allows a 12,000 square foot Gym and it, it will allow you to go to eighteen thousand under their you know their current guidelines. That doesn't mean we can't request a, a larger uh, gym or field house, but anything over that eighteen thousand square feet will be solely at the the town's cost because it's over and above what what MSBA reimburses for in terms of space and and, and program. Um, that said, I think we're, we're working on costs on, on Thursday at the, the building committee. We, we're going to have costs and um, the six new construction uh, options will, will all include uh, a breakout cost for that additional sized uh, field house. I think the, um, the renovation options we're looking at all retain that current uh, 17,000 square foot field house that you, you have right now. Great, thank you. I ask a question, a backup, a follow-up question for that. Um, the field house that we currently have, I'm sure, as you know, has the two stories in it. Is that I see just the basketball courts? I know it's hard to portray two floors in there, but is that something that is being considered at the second floor to have the gym, the gymnastics gym, and the wrestling gym upstairs? Um, I think I think in a renovation option, we're we're going to try and retain all that, um, and then depending on on the the um, the new construction options and how size that how big that gym is whether it's eighteen thousand square feet or it's uh, thirty thousand square feet will will include that gymnastics and other programs somewhere within that uh, that program. Okay, is that a um, the footprint eighteen thousand square feet footprint or is that total space? Uh, so the. So the, the existing field, field house is 17,000 square feet. That's the, the, the big gym. And then the, the, uh, the gymnastics gym, the small gym, I'm not sure what you, you call it, is a separate space. So that's not included uh, when, we, when we say 17,000 square feet. Okay.
Susie's? Yes. Um, Go ahead. I just, what? Sorry. No, no, no. Did you have a question? I do. Well, it's really more, uh, I'm more of a comment. Uh, thanks. I, I, <laughs> I too like Kevin being on the committee, just really wanted to uh, appreciate. Uh, this is our, our second time, I think, that you've been before the school committee within, a, within the last 12 months or so. And, um, you know, between the, the visioning sessions, the workshops, the community forums, uh, permanent building committee meetings, it, it, you guys have really, really done us, you know, done the town well and served us well. And I just wanted to say that as an observer and participant, um, it's really been a very um, well organized, um, well structured, and you know, well represented, well represented process. I am too. I'm impressed. Uh, I was uh, involved in the Galvin uh, uh, work, uh, but this is, you know, uh, this is an entirely different, obviously different school, different needs, um, but just the type of things that have. Uh, provided opportunities for the community to participate have really been very strong. Um, and, the, you know, going, presenting effectively 11 options um, is uh, really an incredible amount of work to try to meet the needs of, of what we're visioning and really to help us sort of get our act together on, uh, on, on this uh, timeline. So I just really wanted to sort of summarize and put that out there to really thank, thank you, Shane um, and Brian and your team uh, it has really, it's really been a, a really good presentation tonight. Um, thank you for getting us in the community up to, up to speed on it. Uh, you know, it seems like if you're not really, uh, you know, there's so many things going on in the world today, not just COVID, but everything else that's happening under the veil of, of COVID. This has sort of uh, been a little bit under the radar screen in, in town affairs, um, but it really hasn't. It has really been... Um, uh, really lots of things are happening and, and going well. So I just wanted to put that out there. And again, just say thank you, Shane. Thank you, Brian and your team members for bringing us where we are today. Thank you. Maybe do we have any remaining questions for SMMA or left field? Okay. I will reiterate what, uh, what Tom said. Thank you. Uh, clearly a whole bunch of good work has been done. I certainly didn't expect to see 12 options. <coughs> so I can't wait to kind of see what the, what your next update will be. Cause I feel like, well, you guys will have narrowed things down and we'll have a little bit more kind of information about how each plan kind of aligns with the criteria. Um, but this is, was a great update. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So just to, again, um, you know, to follow on what Tom says, I think, you know, Doug, Amy, and, and Tim O'Brien have, have put in a, a great amount of effort on this, uh, as well as, as the issues they're dealing with with COVID and running a school. So uh, just thank them. And um, we do have a website. It's wakefieldmhsproject.com, which we, uh, we upload all our presentations, uh, all our documents on that. So if you folks want to check that out. And um, as I said, next Thursday, uh, the building committee meeting, uh, we're going to review these options. And it's at that meeting that we're hoping to narrow them down to uh, to a three or four or five options that we're going to develop in a little bit more detail. So certainly if folks uh, want to join the uh, the agendas on the town website and the agendas on the uh, the project website to, uh, to get the Zoom details. Um, so again, thank you. And... Um, Certainly hope to, to see you guys again soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. You thank too. you very much, guys. Thank you. Shane, Helen, and Brian, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks. You're welcome. See you yeah. yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good, good night. Good night. So, the, so next up, I would like to... Um, and invite Christine to talk a little bit about um, just kind of about our budget timeline. And then Tim can jump in and talk about our capital priorities um, in terms of where we are. Christine? Sure. sure, just really brief. We just wanna make sure um, we're keeping you up to date about um, where we're at. We are still, I know it's all about COVID right now, but we are still presenting a budget. We are working with our principals and department heads Doug, Cara, and I, and Rosie, we met with um, individually with all the principals, 
And then um, for the next two days this week, we are going to group principles together by um, level elementaries tomorrow and then middle and high on Thursday, just to do some collaboration to kind of streamline some of the, the request and some of the thoughts. And then in the next week, or the next two weeks, we're gonna do some staff forums. We're gonna meet with um, teachers and staff and calf workers and custodians and just everyone in the schools to sort of get feedback about what their thoughts are and, and what they really think we should be focusing on in the budget. So really getting input from um, everyone in all levels. And that'll bring us to the end of January and the beginning of February. Also, the Finance and Facilities Subcommittee will be meeting with some liaisons from FinCom. Um, I believe it's the January 20th meeting at the end of the month. So they can um, sort of hear about um, what we're doing and where we're at in the timeline. But, um, you know, the next um, two months will be packed and we'll be um, kind of keeping you up to date of where we're at at this point. Um, and the next part in the budget too, um, I know we've been keeping Tim waiting, but he has um, a capital plan that we need to submit by the end of this week to um, DPW. So um, Tim, I'll, I'll let you um, present the capital plan. Sure, thank you, Christine. Do you need me to share my screen to see this or does? Uh... Um, I actually shared the document with Ryan so that he could pull it up on the, on the, the screen. Okay, fantastic. All right, so not much has changed here um, since we had spoken about it in finance and facilities. And I'll just go through it uh, briefly. Uh, beginning with tier one, these are uh, in order of priority. Uh, on tier one district wide, uh, we're looking at HVAC recommissioning, basically, which means just the continuous evaluation and improvement of our the functionality of our HVAC systems. I think in the age of COVID, this is uh, definitely a priority for us year over year. So it's something we're gonna continuously look at uh, ourselves and DPW, of course, uh, they've been fantastic in, in helping us out uh, daily with, with our, our systems and, and continuing to, to operate and maintain them. Moving down to the doll bear. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to stay, yeah, at the top of, the, yeah, we'll stay in the, the top tier. Yep, tier one right there. Um, the doll bear, we're looking to add badge readers at the calf entrance and the third door, the front entrance. If you're looking at the building from Lowell Street, the third door entrance on your left, uh, it's the kindergarten entrance. Those are the only two doors in that building without badge entry. And in terms of functionality of the building, that, that really presents a road, a literal roadblock for us. Um, they, they're welcoming children into the school from that third entrance. And in addition, uh, our custodians are constantly in and out of that calf entrance with trash and other things. Uh, we take deliveries to the cafeteria through that door. So that has become a, uh, a major functionality issue for doll bear. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, um, how we ended up without those doors being, you know, badge entries, but it's certainly a major need for us right now. Next up would be at the Green, Greenwood School. Currently there's no air conditioning in any of the classrooms. And so we'd be looking to add um, split units, which we've done in the past uh, for the main office and principal's office at Greenwood. Uh, which was was a, was a success, and we'd like to continue that process and add add that um, cooling for the classrooms. An, an additional benefit to that, the Greenwood being an older building, this adds a layer of filtered outside air to that building in those warmer months. Which which again, um, in the age of COVID, is is a wonderful thing. Down to the high school. Um, we're looking to add a Fentrack SSV, which is a sidewalk snow vehicle that we added to the Galvin last year. Um, it is a vehicle that was purchased previously by the town and their buildings di division. It is a game changer when it comes to snow removal. Uh, we can get 
the same amount of work done in about half the time. Um, so as far as, you know, unnecessarily unnecessary day, snow days and delays, um, we can really reduce that. Uh, specifically with the high school, I think it's, it's a good piece of equipment to have now that we can carry with us to a new building as well. Whatever that setup may be, we will be much more well prepared um, for a larger footprint of, of sidewalks and entryways and things of that nature in a new building. And it certainly would, uh, would serve as purpose in our, in our current building as well. So that's it for tier one. Moving down to tier two at the Woodville. Um, I'm in daily contact with, with our technicians from the DPW. This has come up repeatedly since I took the position this, this past summer. Um, the rooftop AC unit at Woodville is reaching the end of its life. Um, so that's something we'd be looking to, to have a conversation about. Definitely a need for us. Um, we have had to you know, perform a number of costly repairs to that recently. I know just, uh, I believe it was the beginning of September, we had to hire a crane to lift a new motor to the roof. Uh, so these, every time we're, we're repairing pieces of this, this unit, it's the pieces, you know, the cost of the materials, um, the labor, plus a crane to, to hoist those materials up to the roof, because naturally it's, you know, it's heavy equipment. Moving down to the Walton, another, another thing that's been coming up recently is the condition of the play, play structure there. Um, it's definitely in need of replacement. Um, I've spoken with Brian and Doug as well. Um, you know, the, the ramp there needs to be rebuilt and, and the, the equipment has, has aged. Um, on the same token at the Doyle, the Doyle school, their playground equipment is relatively new. The playground surface itself, um, is a wood wood chips it it needs to be replaced and and a rubber pl uh, playground surface put down for many reasons um just the functionality uh, of that surface is much easier to to move around on for ada compliance um you know it, it be wheelchair accessible there's a, there's a list of things, uh, how it would improve the, the experience there at the Doyle. Moving down to the Woodville gym, they're in need of a, a strip and, and just, uh, you know, reseal paint um, in that gym. It, it has aged. They've had a few issues from leaks and things of that nature that have damaged that floor over the years. Uh, I, I would say, in my opinion, that um, the... Gym floor has aged more than any other area of that building at this point. I think it's it's time to update that, bring it back to life. At the high school, this is something that we've seen and talked about before. We're in need of a, an updated scoreboard and cage for the field house. Uh, every time we replace bulbs and work on that piece of equipment, it's a quarter of the cost of the full replacement of the unit itself. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind as we just looked at some of the design ideas for the new high school. Some of them may even include um, keeping our current field house. So that's something that we could carry with us um, moving forward into a new building. Down to the tier threes, uh, doll bear rubber playground surface for the same purposes as the Doyle and I think we, we go down to the next page if you can, right? And a, and a new kindergarten playground um, for the doll bear as well. Um, it is it would be next in the queue, um, just an aging aging pieces of equipment, um, and and it's due. Down below there are, there are some justifications, and you know people can read through those as they see fit. I won't I won't bore you anymore. Um, I know it's getting late. We've got some more things to 
to get to. So thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer. So Tim, just before you um, take questions, from a process perspective, we are slated to vote on kind of your proposal that goes in front of the capital um, committee. Um, the capital committee then kind of looks at all of the capital requests coming in across all of the departments. And then they tend to come back with a recommendation of like, this is what we can take on, right? But you, you always submit a tier one, a tier two, a tier three um, for their consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to make sure the committee kind of understands how this works. Oh, sure. Yeah, so we're presented very much the same way. Yep. So, and, and we did share last year's kind of approved expenses just so that people had perspective on kind of what was asked for and what was approved. Um, just so that you have a sense of kind of, are we in line with what we've requested in the past? Right. <laughs> Any questions for Tim? I have a quick question. Um, on the Woodville one, where you talk about the, that it needs the new gym floor um, mm -hmm. due to a leak, is, has that leak been remedied or is that something that's ongoing? Yeah, I think this is, this is something that happened. It happened certainly before my time. Um, I think that it's, it's just showing its age and, and is definitely in, in need of a facelift. Um, these are facilities that we're renting um, on a constant basis. I just want to make sure that, that, um, it's a good reflection of the district in, in that, uh, you know, games can be played appropriately and, and, you know, the full, the full functioning use of the space. And it's, it is something as well that has been listed on, um, on capital in previous years. Thanks. No problem. Tim, I'm, I'm just curious from some, I'm looking at the HVAC uh, recommissioning just in the stuff that's less of a cap expense and more of an operating expense, um, where we, we exist within a municipal space, um, sort of where is, where's that fine line between us, you know, and what the district pays for and what DPW covers? I, I thought maybe you could offer some extra layers of that having come from sort of that sphere. Sure. So I, I do want to be clear about how just fantastic the DPW has been. And that's not just coming from me as a, former DPW guy, they, um, they've come to our rescue a, a lot uh, in these scenarios. Uh, Mike Roberto, he's their HVAC technician. He's been fantastic. And, and uh, Chris Pierce has covered a lot of expenses um, when it comes to that. I think where we are looking for this money is to make sure, you know, year over year, we're ensuring that the best functionality is possible in each of these buildings. So there are obviously some costs that we will incur, whether that be um, improved uh, filter ratings, things of that nature. We just wanna make sure that we're allocating funds in that direction so that, uh, so that we're able to cover it. And so that uh, we're continuously trying to improve air quality in these buildings. So do you consider this as we're just being good partners sort of with DPW and this is kind of our share of that? Certainly it's, you know, it's, okay. um, we may not be able to meet them halfway, but we, we'd like to meet them somewhere and, and continue to do the best we can uh, from an air quality standpoint. Thank you. My pleasure. Any other questions, Tom? Oh yeah, thanks. Oh. Yeah. Hello? Amy oh, too. Man. What's that? Uh, Amy too, but you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, actually, just before Stephen's question, I had my hand up, and it was that very it was that very subject. I just wanted to make note to the uh, committee that we, at the Finance and Facilities Subcommittee, discussed that very issue um, over the course of oh, we had maybe dedicated half the meeting to it when we first reviewed the capital. Um, proposal uh, with uh, uh, Tim and Doug and Christine. Um, and the issue on, on HVAC recommissioning, I think that was why it was turned down last year um, is because capital planning committee, which uh, certainly has the next level of approval, really wasn't in a position to make that determination over, you know, is it a town expense or is it a school expense and where does it best fit? Um, but I think, you know, Tim is spot on in saying we, we owe a great appreciation and gratitude to DPW for 
uh, for, you know, for this, uh, you know, partnership. But at the end of the day, we really need to resolve that. We need to bring that discussion um, a little bit, uh, you know, forward as we started to at, at the subcommittee meeting. Um, and I think it's certainly something that we will pick up uh, when we have some FinCom uh, liaisons at our upcoming meeting, the end of the month, as well as perhaps even uh, when we go to capital itself. Because I think um, the, the, the little, you know, back and forth that we're doing, putting it on the list and then arriving somewhere in the middle, um, we should either codify that, that that becomes a plan or um, we should land on, you know, exactly whose responsibility that, that it is. Um, but I, I think Tim and the DPW are doing everything they can uh, to make to make this work. But so, Stephen, I'm glad you brought that up. I was just going to mention that that's that's an ongoing point of discussion at the subcommittee level. Thanks, Tom. Amy. You're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> So just looking at this sheet, I'm assuming the denied are carryover from last year. Correct. And then the ones without denied are new. Is there anything that a school asked for that isn't on this list? Um, like I don't see Galvin. They didn't ask for any capital. They did not. Okay. Uh, no. But Amy, I, I, know that we spent Two hundred thousand dollars, maybe, uh, last year on replacing all the projectors. So, like the yeah, Galvin yeah. got a big old chunk last year, um, and I think that that's kind of what happens, right? Is that the uh, different schools have different needs, different years. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure, yeah, it was two hundred thousand dollars for the projectors at the Galvin last year, and the Galvin got their snow removal machine last year too. No, I was more curious how the process works all the schools yeah. put there and then 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 does tim say we're not going to include this this year hold that for next year or is everything on that he would just put it as like a tier four yeah so any anything that um you know is basically large enough to, to get on there there's some things that the dpw will put in their local budget or that can get handled in, in other places so you know it wasn't like we prioritize it and said, no, that's, you know, that's, we don't think that's important enough to get on there. So I think anything that anyone's looking for, um, there's a, you know, an avenue to, to get that done. So there was nobody that, that was, we didn't say no necessarily to any, um, any requests. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, Tim, I'm just sort of curious, are there any grants available for this sort of capital needs? For the school, or is it? It's just not something that's out there. I, I, I would probably have to defer to Christine on that question. So, um, as you remember, on our SR three application, we did add some HVAC um, balancing work to that, but it's very, it's very unusual that um, grants will kind of take on these major capital projects. Um, but we do always look for that, Mike. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And Tim, just a clarification kind of related to Amy's ask, and it's more of kind of a process question. Are the schools actually coming with kind of requests or are you as the facilities director kind of have an understanding of the the kind of the big things that are going on in schools that you are keeping a running list of what is needed or is it a combination of both? Because I thought it was more the latter of you as the facilities director kind of having a good understanding of kind of when you look at the school as a whole, what are the things that we need to be um, worried about that are big long-term investments that kind of meet the criteria of what a capital investment is? Sure, so at, at this point, it's certainly been a combination of both things. And I think, okay. Uh, you know, I, I've touched base with principals, I've touched base with head custodians, um, with our tradespeople from the DPW, um, where I've only been here since August. Uh, I think maybe in the coming years, I'll have uh, a more acute knowledge of exactly what needs to be handled each year. But that doesn't mean I will still continuously go to the leadership <coughs> of the buildings to make sure that all their uh, problems and concerns are being addressed. 
Perfect. Thanks for clarifying. Of course. Anybody else have questions? Stephen? One last thing, just looking at um, at the surfaces of the playgrounds, sort of in the elementary levels. Is, does this mean what, if we did both of these playground resurfacing, would that be done with the wood chips at all the schools? Because I'm no, yeah. we, we're looking at rubber. Yeah, the rubber surfaces. No, no, no. I mean, but I, are those the last schools that have wood chips? Would that then mean that we had rubberized surfaces at all of the lower level schools? I would have to, uh, I'd have to get back to you on that, but. Okay, no, not a big deal. I was just, I was just thinking that I, I think as we've resurfaced, these may be the last remaining ones. Which we're, be, we're, which I know we're getting, getting we'd be getting very close to that, but I don't want to, I don't want to uh, speak incorrectly. So, okay. thank you. I believe they are the remaining two, Stephen. Okay. Okay. If we don't have any uh, remaining questions, I think we have a motion, Mr. Mark. We do. Yeah. <clears throat> I move the school committee approve the FY23 budget timeline and capital project list as presented. Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Discussion? Seeing none. Um, Judy, roll call. Ms. Fair. Uh, yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Mr. Boudreau. Yes. Ms. Lehman. Yes. Mr. Ingalls. Yes. Mr. Piscadlo. Yes. Ms. Wall. Yes. Okay. Um, I think we are ready to do subcommittee reports. Um, Doug, I, actually, I should check with you. Are you all set <laughs> with your items? You're, you're, you're spot on. I'm all set. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Um, so first up is finance and facilities which this one's gonna be easy because our last meeting was last Thursday. Um, I believe that was the sixth and the entire meeting, we talked about those capital investments. <laughs> so we really just spent time kind of walking through those with Tim, getting clarity around priorities, talking about how we wanted to present that tonight. Um, and I believe that that was really all that we talked about it. We did, we talked a little bit about snow cause it was Thursday morning and we were talking a little bit about the snow that was planned for the next, or not planned, but expected the next day. Um, we talked a little bit about testing, the fact that tests were happening um, again on Sunday, but the vast majority of the meeting focused on um, capital projects. So <coughs> um, our next meeting is next Thursday, as Christine mentioned, uh, the finance, um, Finance Committee liaisons are planning to, to attend with uh, that meeting with us. And I think that that's it um, for that meeting. Um, and then I don't just, I can't imagine we have more updates on the high school working, the high school working group project, right, Kevin? <laughs> okay. No. I feel like we, we spent enough time on that one tonight. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Tom, updates on labor and personnel? Um, we've had one meeting since um, our last full school committee meeting back in December. Um, the conversation is around setting up some timelines and um, beginning to review internally the types of uh, needs and concerns um, with regard to the collective bargaining process, uh, which we'll be embarking upon uh, for uh, six of our collective bargaining groups um, very, very soon with uh, six contracts up uh, this the, this school year. So um, but there's certainly more to follow on that and that will this will become a regular a regular topic for um, very quickly. But that's what's on our plate, uh, beginning the, the bargaining for um, the winter and spring. Okay. Um, student services, Mike. Yep, so uh, for the first time in recent memory, I'm actually caught up on meeting minutes. So that's kind of a big moment for me personally. Apologies for that. And, uh, thanks to Doug and Judy for helping me to get there. Um, so we had a meeting last Wednesday and we talked about a myriad of topics. Uh, one was the COVID numbers, uh, obviously a, a big item that we discussed tonight uh, quite a bit as well. Uh, we also spoke about the student forum. This is in regard to the logo uh, situation as well. Uh, and we talked uh, 
quite a bit about budget prep and how we get ourselves ready and discuss so the priorities that will take place uh, very shortly for all of us. Uh, so that was it. Uh, that's it on our side. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Uh, Kevin, uh, policy and communications. <laughs> so we haven't met since so our last meeting was on December 14th, which I had reported out that same evening. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for the 18th, uh, where one of the things I had talked about the last time was we were, as we were engaging MASC in, in our, the policy review process, we asked them to, uh, for official, I mean, for assistance uh, on a number of different policies to prioritize those. I know already we're getting some model policies back and different things like that. I envision on Tuesday as a subcommittee we'll to talk about those. Um, and maybe assign those out for, for different models to, to review, to critique, and to provide feedback on. So, uh, those policies in particular, I think, are, are really cool. Um, we also have the opportunity tonight, we have laid on the table a couple of weeks ago, um, the uh, fuel, efficient, fuel efficiency vehicle policy, uh, which was passed by town council. They've asked us uh, to look at it and pass as well as part of the green communities. And, Tim uh, can answer probably questions if people have about, about our vehicles. From what I understand, you know, most of our vehicles will probably be exempt from this policy, but uh, it's certainly an important piece in, this, in, in the green communities and whatnot. So I think we have a motion. We do. I move the school committee endorse uh, and adopt the town of Wakefield fuel efficiency policy as presented. Second. Uh, motion made and seconded. Discussion? So I actually have a quick question, Tim. So you sent over the fleet inventory, mm -hmm. um, which looks like we have 13 vehicles, of which four of those are buses. Actually, five of those are buses. Well, one's an activity bus. I don't know if that kind of, <laughs> how that um, gets ranked or rated. But um, can you just speak at the highest level? Because this policy is all about when we get to replacing vehicles, what we need to replace them with. And I just want to make sure we as a committee kind of understand that, like, if the vast majority of our vehicles don't fall under this policy, that would be good to know. Just knowing that we have 13 vehicles in our inventory was interesting to me. And it looks like about half of them might not apply while the others would but I wanted you to just kind of clarify and speak at the highest level about kind of what our inventory looks like and what the, what this where this policy would apply. Sure. Um, so it, as I understand it, um, most of the vehicles that are currently in our inventory, uh, for instance, we have a, a plow truck in facilities and a, 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 a box truck as well. Neither of those vehicles uh, would be able to be replaced with with a functional alternative at this point uh, to get the same job done. Um, so those those vehicles would have to remain, you know, either a gas or a diesel uh, type vehicle. Buses as well. There currently aren't viable um, replacements for those. There are some brands that are making uh, battery powered buses. But to my knowledge, it's not a uh, it's not an exact science yet, and so it's not something that they're that they're pushing across the board. So these would be smaller vehicles. For instance, I know the gas and light department uses some electric vehicles for their engineers. Um, so people, you know, single persons going around doing doing their work on a daily basis. So nobody that's you know not personnel carrying. Um, vehicles or work uh, related vehicles. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. So Tim of the, like there's three Ford 2017 transit vehicles that are in the school inventory. Mm -hmm. So Tim, first of all, can you just give an example of like what those are used for? So those may be the post minivans, Christina, if that, I might be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. So we have the two Chrysler Pacifica. Those are for the post um, academy to drive the students to their employment. 
And then we do have some activity buses and, and those um, that you talked about were used for um, athletics and things of that nature. Um, they're like the white buses that you see behind the high school. Yep. But Tim is right. I mean, it has to be something that you can um, reasonably replace. <laughs> um, so the buses really wouldn't qualify so much because it'd be um, um, in terms of pricing and availability. Um, but um, things like the, the post, um, the Chrysler's would be something um, that when those are up that we would have to look at um, possible replacements. Um, okay, so it's a small, <coughs> small number of our, of our inventory that would apply yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanna make sure that the committee kind of understood the impact. Any other questions as part of the discussion? Okay, Judy, roll call. Ms. Bayer? Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Mr. Boudreau? Yes. Ms. Lehman? Yes. Mr. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Piscadlo? Yes. And Ms. Wall? Yes. Okay. Um, future dates and agendas. Um, our next meeting is on January 25th. Um, I also want to note that I believe that we have, we then have a week off and then we will have two meetings in a row in February. I believe we have the meeting on the 8th and the 15th because we're avoiding the 22nd, which is school vacation week. So I just want to kind of remind the committee and the public that we are going to have two meetings in a row um, come February. Um, our meeting on the 25th, um, I think that, that there is a plan, um, Doug, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, to talk um, a little bit about student services and student support around mental health, um, as well as uh, talking a bit about health education um, and, a, and a little bit about um, kind of the incident at the high school, what we're doing around education um, of, of students on topics that tend to fall into kind of the health arena. Um, and so I think the intention is to spend a little bit of time on that at the meeting on the 25th. Correct. Okay. Um, any other comments, Doug, that you wanted to make about future agenda items? Or is that good? I think you're good. Okay. Um, school committee comments. Kevin. I think I'm all set. Thank you. Steven. Um, I would just mention the HRC, uh, normally you would see around now that they would be doing an MLK uh, Coretus King uh, presentation that's always really well done. Um, they just recently have transitioned that to be a, a remote event. Um, there'll be a Zoom link and I believe it may be carried by WCAT. Um, so just put that sort of in your radar if, if that's something you'd like to attend. Um, and then I would also just say sort of thank you for all the, the work that our educators have been doing and, and parents and teachers and everyone. I know that this is a tough time. Um, I don't think anybody expected us to sort of be where we are now coming um, you know, after the holidays. I know it's been tough. Um, so just a, a thank you for everyone that's been hanging in there and has uh, just exhibited so much patience, uh, which is what's been needed. So that's all. Stephen, um, do you know what time the MLK event is on Monday? Do you happen no. to know? I feel like it used to be at 11 o'clock in, in yeah, the past. Yeah, it, it was earlier in the, I don't. Okay. All right. I'll look that up. Thank you. Um, Michael. Yep. I just wanted to uh, kind of jumping off of Aaron's comments today, and I want to make it perfectly clear. We all value the teachers very, very much. Uh, and um, hopefully they don't have that wrong impression, you know, they are the secret sauce that allows us to really do what we do from an educational system. So um, we all, to a person, appreciate greatly all that they go through, as well as the administration uh, and all, all the uh, guts uh, that the kids are showing in regards to this as well. So I am uh, hopeful that 2022 settles down fairly soon. I know we've been saying that for about a year and a half. So I hope that comes to fruition in the next few months so we can get back to a reasonable state of normal. So thanks to everybody for all you're doing and happy new year. Thanks, Mike. Um, Amy Waller. 
Uh, just a couple of things. One that um, kindergarten registration, I believe, opened up yesterday. Um, so anybody that has an incoming um, kindergarten, or did I say freshman? Oh, Sorry, one going into one and one going into the other. I can't keep them together. Kindergarten <laughs> registration opened up. So that uh, is ongoing now. Um, there's some information on the school's website about that. And just wanted to say um, thank you to the um, team with Shane and um, Helen and Brian. I forget if that's all their names, but they did a great job. Thank you. And thank you to Aaron uh, for speaking tonight. I hear you. And um, like Mike said, um, I'm in your corner and and happy to listen to you guys. So thanks. Amy Lehman. Uh, my comment's more of an ask. Maybe at the next meeting, if we could get a, a budget timeline, if it's ready, as far as this is when we're going to present to FinCom, this is when it goes to town council, when the um, public hearing is for, you know, community members to come to the school committee. I don't know if it'll be ready next week, but I would like a visual of some sort. Um, and then, yeah, just, what, just to echo what Mike and Amy said, just to thank the teachers, uh, you know, I picked two kids up from school and you, you wouldn't know that there's COVID. They come home happy and educated. So doing a great job. Thank you. Tom. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Susie. Uh, I too want to echo uh, what uh, now Mike and Amy and Amy and Stephen have said. Uh, couldn't agree more. Um, we, uh, we, we would be nowhere without the quality work and dedication and love that our teachers and all of our staff put into um, the, making the front lines of education work in Wakefield. <clears throat> so I certainly join in, in valuing every hour of every day that our teachers put in and the, and the countless hours um, that they're not in the buildings but are still providing work and support and, and education to our kids. Uh, we will certainly, uh, we, will, we will rectify whatever situations need to be uh, so resolved uh, to make sure that we at least are on um, are on common ground. Um, uh, uh, the other thing I'd like also add, uh, thank the community uh, who participated in last week's uh, forum on the Wakefield Warrior logo. Um, also, a great thanks to the administration, uh, Doug and Amy McLeod and Will Cavanaris for the work that they did in facilitating and putting the forum together. I thought it was uh, well done. Uh, I thought they asked some, some leading and provocative questions and looking forward to seeing some of the answers and surveys that, that were provided there. Um, but that, that work um, is, um, while it's, you know, maybe not in the, the priority of the day all the time, but it's certainly something that is important, very important to the community as we seek to, um, to do nothing more than bring the community together um, at all times. And uh, I just wanted to thank, thank the folks who, who, who joined in and participated in that. So, and, uh, and happy new year all. I too hope 2022 is, uh, continues to be better and better. Thanks. Doug, you wanted to kind of add something in before I make my final comments and, and, and the meeting? Yeah, I, I, first I want to thank everyone for their comments about staff. We appreciate it. And I know our, our staff appreciates the recognition. So just one more piece. If you're interested in being part of the Warrior Logo Committee, um, registration or application can be made uh, throughout the remainder of this week. And so an email address was shared. If you need that, you can reach out to our office directly or you can certainly reach mm -hmm. out to the Great, thanks, Doug. Um, and on, on that note, um, I unfortunately was unable to attend the forum last week. I uh, ended up being very ill that night and was unable to attend. And I'm actually hoping that it was recorded and I can watch it after the fact. But I did read the article and the the, the item about it. And it, it did really sound like um, Will Carbonaris did a, a really nice job kind of moderating. Um, it sounded like there were some really, like you said, Tom, provocative questions that kind of, um, kind of takes you away from Kind of the controversy and and talks about kind of what we what we want to stand for what we believe in uh, what we want this logo to represent and um and so i i got a good a good feel just reading the article about kind of how it went um, but i do hope to watch that um, at a later date um, but i do want to thank everybody that participated because i think it was it sounds like it was well attended with um lots of kind of good thoughts shared um 
I also want to kind of um, reiterate all of the things that committee members said earlier, but I think Stephen, you kind of got to the closest of it, um, of how I'm feeling, which is, um, I don't think we ever thought that this is where we were going to be the first week in January coming back. Um, and I think in many ways, what teachers are up against right now may, may be the most complicated situ situation we've been in, um, in that you are where our staff is down, you have kids at home, you have kids who are home at sick, sick, you have kids home quarantined, but you have more kids home sick. Um, and keeping track of who is where and what are they doing and what's going on with work assignments is um, a tremendous amount of work. And I, I've watched it because I've had two of my kids home with me um, and, and just the communication that we've gotten has been phenomenal. Teachers have been great in getting back um, to them about what they needed to do. And, um, and I think we're in a, in a really complicated um, situation right now. And as Doug, you spoke about earlier, kind of everybody is like, it's all hands on deck trying to figure out how we cover this and how we figure it out and how, how do we keep kids in school? Because if we've learned anything coming back this year is we know our kids need to be in school. Um, it has not been a good or easy 18 months for these kids when uh, the uncertainty of, of COVID er, early on. Um, and so I think uh, everyone has said this, but a, a, a heartfelt thank you to teachers and administrators for doing everything that needs to be done in order to just keep kids in school and keep them participating in the activities that make them feel somewhat normal. Um, and, and I really appreciate that the administration hasn't done anything um, kind of, uh, I can't think of the word, but uh, drastic um, in kind of changing things up and, and really trying to balance the how do we keep kids in school. And so I, I just wanna, um, say thank you to, to teachers and staff and administrators for doing what I think is an incredibly, incredibly difficult job, maybe more so than it's been all along. And I, I do think that hopefully this is going to last not very long and we're going to be out of it, you know, pretty, pretty soon. But um, appreciate the kind of the flexibility that you guys have all shown. And I'll end with something that Isabella mentioned, um, which is the senior class uh, fundraiser. They're doing a, a raffle that um, I believe they're pulling the winners on the 25th of January. And the URL to participate in this raffle, it's, it's not an easy one to remember. It's um, Linktree, but there's like a dot in the middle of Linktree. So it's L-I-N-C-K-T-R dot E-E -E, and then slash W-M-H-S for Wakefield Memorial High School 2022. And I, and I call this out only because I think the class of 2022 is in a, um, an interesting predicament of sorts in that it has not had a lot of opportunity to do fundraising. And when you think about that class and how they have not been in school much, and here we are leading into their senior year where all of their senior activities need to be funded. Um, I just ask that people uh, consider making a special donation to, to this raffle. There's lots of really great raffle baskets um, but consider supporting this particular class because I think they've um, they've had a really tough go at having time to be able to do fundraising. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Susie, can you say that website again? Yeah, so it's Linktree, and it's L I N K T R, and then it's dot oh. E E, and then it's the slash W M H S twenty twenty two. It's a very odd URL and they really need to have like a, a vanity URL that makes it easier to be able to say it. <laughs> um, right. uh, so I think we've got a motion to adjourn, um, Tom. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Susie, for that, to that URL, is that a, a dot .com, a dot .org or? It's not, it's a dot .ee, -E, which is what's so odd about it, right? So it's, it, it, I was able to oh, type oh, L-I-N. Okay. Yeah, so that it, instead of a dot com, it's dot e e slash w m h s twenty twenty two. I get it. All right, my mistake. Sorry about that. It just yeah, it is. It is. It is a tough, uh, a tough one to think about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, I move the school committee adjourn its meeting of Tuesday, January 11, twenty twenty two. Second. Motion made and second in discussion. Seeing none, uh, Judy, roll call. <coughs>
Ms. Vare? Uh, yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Mr. Boudreau? <laughs> Mr. Boudreau? Sorry, yes, I apologize. <laughs> Ms. Lehman? Yes. Mr. Ingalls? Yes. Mr. Piscadlo? Yes. Ms. Wall? Yes. All right, everybody, thanks very much for tuning in. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good, good night, night, all. Bye-bye. Happy New Year.